Okay, so we're going to be talking about uh, customer's delight, uh, incorporating personalization and unique experience and strategy. Uh, my name is Omar Akhtar. I work for Altimeter Group. We're a research and digital advisory firm based out here in San Francisco. So we try to analyze trends and see how technology is going to be affecting businesses and what are some of the decisions we have to make now. And personalization is, is right at the top of that. I'm going to let my uh, panelists um, introduce themselves. I'm really excited for them to come up here. And there's three great companies and a diverse uh, range of experiences between the three of them. So thank you guys for joining me on stage today. Um, and uh, yeah, starting with Sheila. Awesome, yeah, thank you so much for, for having me. My name is Sheila Vashi. I work at a company called Open Door. I've been there for about a year. Open Door has uh, the ambition, ambitious vision of revolutionizing the real estate industry. So uh, the current process of buying or selling a home is extremely painful today. It takes over three months uh, if you're looking to sell your home and you have open houses and you need to list and buyers fall through and there's a bunch of pain and hassle. And Open Door completely changes that and you can uh, close on your home in as little as a week. And so it delivers significant convenience to customers and also speed that if you have a new job or a new family or baby or getting married and you need to move on a very quick timeline, you can do so. So that's Open Door. Prior to Open Door, I was at Dropbox for about five and a half years um, leading a bunch of the marketing team. And uh, before that, Apple and, and The Gap and, and investment banking. So that's me. And the second marketing hire at Dropbox. I was, right? yes, wow. that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Cafeteria. Is this on? I think this is on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The, it's, a, it's the 10 pounds that you gain when you start yeah. a Dropbox. Well, at Nestle, we call it the Nestle 20. Um, <laughs> Good point. Yeah, uh, I'm Orchid Ferguson. Um, I head up digital innovation at Nestle USA. It just says Nestle there, and I was like, oh, I got a promotion. Like, that's awesome. Um, but no, so it's I know, global. Uh, so Nestle is the largest CPG in the world. We have about 2,000 brands. Uh, in the U.S., you know, we have different operating companies like Gerber, Purina, Nestle Waters, you've heard of all of them. Um, under my purview, I have about 50 brands, uh, give or take, depending on how many we're incubating and how many acquisitions we're making. We're obviously expanding our coffee portfolio, so uh, we have majority share of Blue Bottle now. Um, we are distributing the Starbucks pods um, at home, and then we also acquired Chameleon Cold Brew. So, you know, someone's spending money, I think it's us. Uh, and I, in terms of my role, I've been at Nestle for about three years now, um, and I set the roadmap and vision and designed the pilots for emerging technology that we want to understand. Uh, so for instance, over this year and next, AI is a large stream of work, obviously. Um, we have organized it by uh, interface, so text-based, so chatbots, voice, uh, and then image. So ranging from image recognition to AR, VR, um, and then social commerce is a large stream of work as well. Uh, that's it. Before that, I was at an agency, at a creative agency, and then before that, I was in consulting. Hi, my name's David Toner, and I head up consumer marketing at Shutterfly. And when you said a, a diverse um, range of experience, I guess you were saying since I'm the eldest, that's why I'm the last, because I have the longest uh, range of experience. But um, at Shutterfly, and, and several people today have said that you're Shutterfly customers, so you already know um, what we offer. But for those of you who don't, um, this is an interesting topic to be talking about personalization because our company really is about providing a platform for consumers to personalize photographs, create stories, share their favorite moments in um, photo merchandise. So photo books, holiday cards, um, and remember the holidays are coming up, so find those photos that you want to use. Do you have a promo code? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> David Toner. Um, uh, you can easily find a promo code on our site any day, every day. Um, so, um, you know, personalization really is our platform that we offer to consumers, but personalization in terms of a marketing platform and the way we engage with consumers, um, we're, I would say, at early stages, though maybe a little more advanced than some, so look forward to discussing that. Great, thanks. So, um, I'm already getting a little sad because I have so many questions to ask, given I, did, I just heard that background. Uh, by the way, we're going to open the floor up uh, 10 minutes uh, just before the hour for questions, so hold on to those. Um, but in the meanwhile, I'd love to get a, a sense of where you guys are in your personalization journey right now. So um, just a sense of what, what, what was it like when you first got into the roles you're in right now, and where are you right now in terms of how good things are? 
We are debating the definition of personalization. <laughs> okay, let's let's go way back then. Okay, so yeah, that how how hard is that to do? How do you define? Where do you do? You, I mean, I know you've got your own problem, which is there's product personalization and and, and all that stuff. Um, and I don't know how far you guys go into that with the marketing department, but there's also just experience personalization mm -hmm. and uh, a whole lot of other things. So how do you guys set those parameters? I can start. Yeah. So I would say we're uh, we're we're still starting the journey of personalization, and but we're we're proving out the impact right now. And what's really interesting for us is acquisition on the marketing side exists both on offline and online channels, and personalization looks different on those channels. Um, so just to give some specific examples, direct mail is a really big driver of growth for us. It's really surprising. No one reads their mail anymore, uh, but we target homes and homeowners, and we can be actually be incredibly targeted uh, based on data that we have access to, um, based on how long someone's been in a home, how much equity they have, and a lot of demographic data. And so personalization there in some of our early tests has actually really paid off. And so for us, we're in the kind of test and iterate stage. We're doing similar things on our digital platforms. And um, custom growth funnels have also been extremely uh, performative for us. So um, we basically, we're, we're now getting into the mindset of every ad deserves its own funnel. Because when you're responding to an ad, or you're responding to a specific search term, you have a specific intent. And driving everyone to the same ex digital experience doesn't perform as well as, as uh, an experience that's actually custom based on the intent that you've expressed. And I would say we're still proving out that strategy, but it's returning um, in a big way for us so far. And so we'll probably look to customize uh, more of our approach, actually. What does personalization and direct mail look like? So uh, we know that, for example, if you have young kids, you really appreciate the convenience of not having to list your home and go through a bunch of open houses. If anyone here has kids, I'm sure you can't, uh, you, you would not want to go through the process of cleaning up the house and getting your kids out of the ready, throwing everyone in the car, getting your dog in the car, and driving around for three hours while people come and look at your house. And so we know that if you have pets or young kids, you're more likely to want to use our service. And so what we do, based on data that we have, is we actually customize the materials to reflect where you are in your stage of life. And we also are extremely targeted uh, based on, on that data. And that allows us to be much, much more efficient in that channel. We are in a totally different spot. <laughs> so our global team, because we're a large organization, we came up with our own acronym for personalization called PCE which stands for Personalized Consumer Experiences. Um, Global had put together a workshop and a team, and they, we've been talking about it for three years, actually. Uh, but when it comes down to the local markets, you know, I have 50 brands. So we actually have to still define what personalization means, what level makes sense for us when we're selling Hot Pockets and DiGiorno and Hagen does. Mm -hmm. Um, and also, like, at what moments does it make sense? And if it is, if we're going to focus, for example, all of our efforts on personalizing the website experience, finding a common infrastructure that works for all 50 brands. Um, so, so our challenges are a little bit different. We do have some brands like Gerber that are ahead of the curve when it comes to personalization. Uh, we have a subscription service called Dottie uh, through Gerber, and that's for new parents because um, I'm a fairly new parent. I have a one and a half year old. Um, it is a shit show because I don't know what I'm doing most of the time. Um, no one does. <laughs> and, I, and I had that margarita like four, four hours ago. Um, but, you know, it, there's, it is a moment, I think, in your life where you, know, you haven't done something that you don't know anything about. And so you're looking for help and you're going, you know, to Google and you don't even know if like mommybloggers.com is a legitimate site. And so, you know, we saw a way for us to be helpful to the new parent. Uh, we're, no, we're no longer saying mom, so, you know, uh, it is 2018. Um, and so it is actually a, a, a subscription service um, where you would pay a monthly subscription and then we actually have live people as well as chatbots answering your questions, you know, centered around infant nutrition. I mean, I think a lot of like eating and pooping is like a big part of my life right now, um, but also expanding out to, you know, various growth stages. So, you know, we are trying to take the learnings from that Gerber team and actually replicating some of those successes within the rest of our brands because we know that we're on a common infrastructure. So I have two follow-ups to that. The first one is 
how do you decide? How did you decide that Gerber was going to be the first one to test the whole thing, um, given that you've got fifty brands and they're all probably clamoring yeah. uh, for that kind of technology and, yeah. and expertise? How did you get to Gerber? And the second one is, um, given that you guys are CPG, you don't often own the end experience mm -hmm. in most cases, right? Yep. So um, how does that factor into your thinking when you can't control? most of the journey. Sure. Uh, so number one, Gerber. Um, you know, Gerber, I think, historically has been more of an educational brand. Mm -hmm. So we've created so much content, and there's so much content around parenting and feeding and babies. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of marketers within our organization who approach personalization, they don't realize how much content is needed to really provide that experience, mm -hmm. like a great user experience. So Gerber kind of made sense for us. Um, there and then the second part, you know, we don't own our cart, right? Because you're not going to DiGiorno.com and buying four pizzas. The day someone does that, I will legitimately quit because that will never happen. So, you know, for us, it, I think it's it's all about. I'll back up. So we are. We have a digital center of excellence and we need to evolve because you can't just tack on digital in front of something anymore. Yes. It's not like new media. Mm -hmm. So we are actually evolving the team into consumer experience, right? So if you reorganize under consumer experience, consumer journey mapping is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what we're doing is picking our tier one brands, which are our billion dollar brands, we'll start there first, map out that consumer journey, mm -hmm. identify moments that make sense to personalize and then prioritize all of those moments and then start from the top. Um, you know, the reality is that we are not, in terms of conversion or even like post-purchase personalization, that's not something that we can do today, and we'll probably put that in a lower priority, mm -hmm. um, just because we need to control what we can control. But right. yeah, I think about it all the time. I'm yeah. actually very stressed out about it. <laughs> <laughs> we can't tell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I had a very emphatic yes in the middle because you said that we got to, we've got to stop putting digital in front of things, and I could I literally authored um, um, a, a PowerPoint slide today that said that in bold letters, saying that mm. we've got to stop doing that because the minute you do that, you absolve everybody else of mm. any of the stuff that you're doing, like the customer centricity, the data analysis. Uh, the digital team will take care of that, but I'll leave you guys to fight with us at the end of the hour on that one. Um, David, how's it going? Uh, it, it's a range, and it really is, you know, starting closest in, when, when you're on the Shutterfly site, when you sign in to Shutterfly, we have tens and tens of billions of photos, so we're able to show you your photos in Shutterfly products to help inspire, um, you know, what's possible with the photography. So the closer you are to us, the more personalized the experience. But then going the next level out, we can send you an email, and we've done this a number of times, um, showing you your holiday card photo from the year before in this year's holiday cards, you know, with a new personalized foil, so inspiring you what can be possible. People love to see their picture in an email, except we often do get customer service calls or emails saying like, did you send my picture to all 15 million users? It's like, no, 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 that was just a one-to-one, -one. you know, that was a definition of one-to-one -one marketing, which we, um, actually, that should be the subject line, like, this is for you and you only. Um, because there is kind of this spook factor, and that is as you move further out, right? So starting on the site when you're signed in, you know you see your photos, and, and that's inspirational. We've seen really good response, really great open rates when we show people their photos in emails from the year before. We wanted to test, and uh, Brian, you can actually let me know if we actually did this. We were going to put last year's holiday card into an envelope and send it out to users. And as we just started to think it through and the experience of opening an envelope at your house and seeing yourself or your family look back at you, there was a major, major creep factor. So, you know, it is like, how far can you go with personalization and what's the consumer expectation? And then where do you cross that boundary? And earlier today when we chatted, we were talking about, I think, you know, something that will stick with me forever is when Facebook six or eight years ago got their hand slapped for pulling your friends' photos and putting them in ads for other brands, and you were like, what, you know, that was supposed to drive affinity to the brand because I was seeing someone I went to grade school with picture, but, you know, that was a serious creep factor, and they pulled that back, you know, so I, I think we're all trying to find that right point of what's engaging, what's inspiring without crossing the line. Can I build on that? Yeah. <laughs> so 
So uh, earlier this year, Mary Meeker and her internet trends, uh, you know, the 300 slide deck, uh, she did dedicate, you know, I think a couple of slides to the privacy paradox. Um, where consumers, they don't, you know, they want their data to be private, but they also want content and recommendations that are relevant to them. And so, you know, for us, you know, even defining personalization, I think one is like, what does that mean? But also like, what degree are we comfortable with that like our consumers are expecting without us getting into like, you know, sending someone prenatal vitamins and they don't even know they're pregnant yet, you know? Mm -hmm. Just to just to add on to that, sorry, we'll let you we'll let you ask questions in a second. Um, I, I think it's a, yeah. I think we all have the target. When I mean, we mentioned that earlier today, the the target example of the the woman was outed for being pregnant because her dad got a like a something in the mail from Target. So no one wants that to happen. Um, for me, the the rule of thumb I have is uh, when someone displays intent. We should uh, aim to deliver the best experience with the data that we have, uh, and. For us, uh, the way that's manifested is we, if you're interested in selling your home, you come to our site or you come to our app and you give us some information on your home. And I, we sort of view it as a mandate. If you've taken the time to give us that information, you deserve a custom experience based on that information. And uh, so that's kind of the rule of thumb that, that we've been using to get away from that freak factor of how did you get this information on me? Why do you know this about me? Uh, stop you know, reading my emails feeling. Uh, and it's really when a user has given you something valuable, it's sort of um, on, on the company to deliver value in return through a more customized experience. Right, so I'll build upon that and say, we, we have very successful wedding streams or new baby streams and other things like that because a consumer has shown intent, they've raised their hand. But that also means that we as marketers have to stand back. We can try to inspire. We can drive that intent and get the consumer to raise their hand. But you know, then it becomes a gating factor to personalization, right? So the consumer does have to raise their hand. You can't proactively personalize. I think you can do. I think you can do it based on even what they click on, Joe, sure. because that can signify intent. Right. Um, so search queries or or even ad selection mm -hmm. can help you understand the value prop that they care about. So that's one example where a marketer can act on that even if someone hasn't gone through your full process or flow. Um, has the whole Facebook, <laughs> sorry, you're out of a job. But... <laughs> <laughs> the bar's open. <laughs> um, yeah, how has the Facebook Cambridge Analytica thing like uh, impacted how you guys think about personalization? Because yeah. I think when the whole thing broke, it was so funny, not funny, but like consumers were like, oh my gosh, I didn't know you had this much data on us. And I think f from a marketer perspective, we're like, how did you not know that? You know, <laughs> yeah. so I, I just wonder if you think about things differently. I think that and GDPR has actually affected us quite a bit. I'm sure everyone in this room uh, is familiar with the, with the impact, but we just don't have data the way that we used to. And in some ways, we're on digital, digital channels more similar to the offline channels in terms of what we can actually analyze. Uh, my concern, actually, with, with those trends is that, at least for us, we're extremely, we, we measure everything that we spend on. Everything has to be measured. And pulling back on the ability to measure things like video and display channels uh, make it harder for us to invest in them. So I'm actually concerned that broader awareness channels will actually get less investment because they're harder to measure now. Yeah. Didn't exactly answer your question, but sort of did. I thought it was great. <laughs> so it sounds to me like there's every time we start with personalization, there's a series of a hierarchy of questions that we have to answer. So we have to know what their intent is. We have to know. Um, how creepy we can go before they, 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 they get completely turned off. And then we have to figure out what exactly is the right thing to deliver them in the moment so that they'll take some sort of action. And it sounds to me that a lot of times all that data lives in three different places. So how are you guys figuring out how to bring that data together in one place? Um, my personal um, uh, battle that I'm fighting is against the idea of the 360 degree view of the customer. I feel like it's just a quagmire uh, when, you, when you're really just searching for the right 45-degree view of the customer, how are you guys dealing with that issue? 
you pick a lane and you test it, and if it doesn't work out, you test something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, like mm -hmm. I think for us, you know, even um, even our data, like we don't have a lot of first party data. Right. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so we were extremely reliant. We still are um, about like third party or like you know Facebook targeting or whatever that might be. Mm -hmm. um, and so we still have this conflict of balancing between like how well do we need to know our consumers, how targeted do we need to be, you know, balancing CPMs and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because uh, at the end of the day, I call the Hagen Dazs consumer, you know, anyone with a mouth, right? So like, how sophisticated <laughs> do you have to be? So that's still something that we're balancing out. Doesn't really answer your question, but. It's comforting to know that that's how we're being segmented. <laughs> <laughs> like anybody with a mouth who is no. not all the humans not dairy free. Although we do offer a great non dairy offering. Now, so. I, I think that's a really difficult question and siloed data and a lack of clear strategy for our data infrastructure is one of the things that keeps me up at night actually, and uh, we are making a move to a DMP, data management platform, that will allow us to tie our data sets together, right. but it's siloed right now, yeah. and uh, and it's it doesn't allow us to unlock the full value of, of the data that we have. So I don't have a good answer for that right now, actually. We're, we're actively trying to fix it, but that's one of my biggest chal challenges. Sure. Yeah. So do you think that um, along with the, the limitations of the DMP, um, is it a matter of figuring out who owns it yeah, I would say that's that's the other problem. Fast growing businesses, I've now been in multiple of them. Yeah. Uh, always the the uh, investment in infrastructure always lags growth. Mm -hmm. So you always think about it too late. Right. And then it becomes really, really hard to change systems and processes mm -hmm. to um, put everything in the same data warehouse or like think through the right strategy for piping data into different systems. Um, and it's it's interesting actually, I brought in the the uh, head of internal systems from Dropbox, a really good friend of mine, into Open Door, and I was just like, tell everyone how you do it because we need to know. We need to start ahead of the game uh, to to fix it. But I think it's just a, a people don't actually understand the importance of it um, because it actually leads to greater efficiency of your spend, but when you're in growth mode, yeah. it doesn't matter as much. Sure, and I would imagine that that's compounded at uh, bigger companies like Shutterfly. Right, it's interesting. I, I would say that you all have the advantage because you can grow into new systems, whereas uh, you know we're an older e-commerce company, 19 years, and have acquired other companies. Then you have different platforms, different databases. Um, I, I always look with envy at younger companies because you can start with a platform, presumably that can consume all of the data in one place and then push it out. So, you know, we're building a marketing tech stack right now, but. Um, getting every you know all of the different systems to talk to legacy systems. You can bring in the hottest new technology, but to get everything to work together, um, it's baby steps and lots of testing and iteration. Right. Yeah, we're okay. in that we're in that same place. I actually um, compared our tech stack to like one of those trailer homes that you like build on to over time, and then all of a sudden you have doors that open into walls. Yeah. That's <laughs> what we have. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say that I, the, the metaphor that I use is we're, we're building the plane while we fly it. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I totally hear you that we can start from scratch, but we're, st we're moving so fast and we, it's really hard to prioritize the back end because the front end requires so much work and it drives growth. And so we're still not investing the way that we should be, even though we need to be. And right. that is actually a little bit frustrating, frankly. Yeah. Um, what I would love to know is if you guys... It, at, how you're thinking about organizing for that. Is it, um, what we've seen with a few companies is that they either have a central data intelligence, Uber godlike data group that yeah. knows all the data about customers and then figures out how to divvy it up and give it to the different channels. Uh, very few companies have the scale and the capabilities to do that. Um, we, what we've seen companies do is cobble together a working group of data specialists from every channel or every um, uh, uh, business area and they meet once a month and they share insights and, and, and things like building a customer journey that spans it. Um, what are your personal experiences with that kind of organization? How would you like to do it? Anyone, any takers? I've been in the latter group both times, like yeah. both times I've been through a hyper growth experience at a company. Yeah. And I agree it's not optimal, but it just comes back to prioritization sure. of right. back end resources and they, they always 
fall behind, frankly. Right. Uh, I actually think the first way is the better way to do it. Mm -hmm. But it's also, it puts a lot on a single team or entity to right. really think through where you need to be years from now, and that's mm -hmm. really hard. Sure. So um, anyway, that's how I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm actually kind of anxious thinking about it now, but we have, I mean, you know. We, You're gonna be a wreck at the end of this. I, one. <laughs> I'm a mess, guys. Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of it is really hard for us because, you know, as a large organization, we are extremely siloed. And so the marketing function is separate from the sales function. And like, there are teams like the e-business team that should be under sales, but they're actually under marketing. And then along with that, with, with data comes power. And so then you kind of have this weird like infighting and cross-functional. And so for us, it has to come from the executive team. So we've um, recently, uh, we have a new CEO in the US, Steve Presley, and he was originally the CFO. He's amazing, he's great. He's going through you know, a cultural um, shift within the organization. So I think for him, he's just like, hey, like, how can we take on some, I mean, this is gonna seem really trite, but like, how can we take on some of the characteristics of high growth companies, whether it's growth hacking, or I think he still used the word hustle, and I was like, please don't use the word hustle. Um, but like, I think there's almost like an all hands on deck thing. So I think you know, for us, it has to come from the top, and then you know, people feel empowered to just kind of say like, doesn't matter who owns this as long as it gets done. And then like we're just trying to figure out if someone's gonna step up and do it. I don't think it's gonna be me. But you know, someone. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean I think just as and this has been a theme throughout the day, just as marketers, the the language that we use and and the intersections within companies are so completely different than it was 10 years ago, than it was 15 years ago, or, you know, someone showed a slide earlier today of the Mad Men era where, you know, it was just about pretty pictures, cocktails, and cigarettes, but, you know, it it's working with um, your internal analytics and data teams. The new hires, and I've, I've heard this at other conferences, within marketing are now data scientists. It's not creative. It's not marketers madmen or math men yeah, yeah. Oh, I like Ex that. exactly you know so i mean so it, it and it <laughs> is like it, it's creating a bridge to ctos to cfos and to and it's dependent to be able to work cross functionally um, a, you know, and your org is completely different than my org, but still the same way. You just have to go out to bring all of that data together because a DMP is not good if it doesn't connect into your data warehouse, into your customer database. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think the building of data lakes uh, is another yes. thing that, that just kind of terrifies people. They're going to drown in it. Yeah. <laughs> well, because we have lots of ponds right now, yeah. right? Um, I think it's, it's important to, what I recently learned um, is what most people call a DMP is actually a CDP, which is a customer data platform, which is a tiny DMP that only pulls the stuff you need. And the DMP is something bigger like a blue Kai or like an actual data warehouse where you can buy data and stuff like that. Um, but once again, this changes every year. So. Don't quote me I, I spent the last year telling everyone that everything would change once we brought our DMP on board. And, and if anyone challenged me with that today, I would deny ever having said it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah absolutely. And, and often it's like the only place to look is technology first, right? And, and But so many times it's, it's really just a, a strategy problem, right? Totally. Yeah. Um, so we talked about the problems with data, but save it thought for the content and creative people, right? So now they're suddenly being tasked with make a thousand iterations of this simple ad or message because we want to personalize the hell out of everything. How are you guys coping with this? This has completely reshaped, I think, the way that design teams operate. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a design team dedicated to marketing. Mm -hmm. And the way that that team looks is totally different to your point from 10 years ago. Um, now, 10 years ago, we might have worked with an agency and it's all about the creative idea and it's the Mad Men ideal. Now I'm like, <laughs> I want the team to sit down and build a performance engine. I need production designers taking each idea and to your point, cranking out 50 different iterations that I can put across all of our channels to optimize and drive the best performance. And so the, the way the team looks is totally different. The type of work is totally different. And, uh, and it's all, data is king. It's all about what actually has the highest CTR and, and conversion rates. And in an ideal scenario, you want them to produce assets that can be 
composited and delivered. Yeah. So the email or whatever communication that each person in this room is getting is different. So it's not the finished beautiful ad. It's a bunch of assets that machine learning can then serve and the DMP can serve. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So yeah, go on. I was gonna say our struggle is that, you know, you described the Mad Men area ten, er, era 10 years ago and we still use very big legacy uh, creative agencies. And we do have an internal um, you know, agency team that are more editors and, and are more nimble. But you know, I guess my question to you is like, when we brief in a creative agency on like the big idea and they like write a manifesto that nobody reads, it's like at what point, like are you saying like, hey, I need this big idea and like here are the parameters of what I want from it? Like, you know, whether the creative is, um, you know, individualized for like, you know, different interests or different like segmentation. And then like part of that too is balancing out between, you know, for Purina, is it personalized enough that we're showing like a golden retriever or can it just be like a generic mutt, you know, like that sort of thing. And can I add uh, to her question? Uh, I would love to know, and I'm sorry, we were just focusing right on you. But it's like, <laughs> you, you seem to have all the answers. Oh, no. I definitely um, don't. <laughs> is it, how, how much personalization is enough, right? Like you said 50 iterations, and I know Lexus did like a thousand iterations of yeah. one thing. And at some point, there's probably diminishing returns, right? Um, how do you figure that out? Okay. I'll, I'll start, but you guys should definitely uh, jump in. Uh, it's, it, that's a really hard question. It, it comes back to ROI and, and return on investment of resources and time in addition to dollars. Um, I think if if you have an external agency, then then it's based on spend. If you have an internal agency, it's based on time, and you have to find the point of diminishing returns, basically, for additional creative. Um, for to to go back to your question, it's really interesting. I think th um, I'm seeing a bifurcation a little bit in performance marketing and what. Uh, what you're detailing, which is a little bit more kind of like brand-driven marketing. And I think those two are at odds. And performance marketing, highly targeted, highly measurable, completely ROI-based. Brand campaigns uh, can be more around an idea and a theme and meant to drive awareness and perception, but much harder to measure. And I think the challenge for us as marketers is how do you blend the two into a recipe that's gonna drive the business? For the, the way that we've thought about it is we have markets where we can run different types of tests and campaigns. And for us, any brand spend or campaign ideas need to drive incremental growth. And we do match market tests, we do pre and post, and we do regression analyses across our markets to see is that incremental spend actually adding to the performance spend that we're putting out in a market. And it's, it's hard to tie that sometimes, but that's how we show ROI. And so that's a little bit of like, I think the old way and the new way at war when you're really kind of delivering on a, on your marketing goals. No, I, th I think that's great. That's super helpful because, I mean, not to get into like the nitty gritty of Nestle, but we have our shopper teams, right, who work with our retail customers on like circulars and all of that in-store stuff. You've got the e-business team, um, which works with our online retailers, uh, and then you've got the brand team. And so uh, kind of like a macro, like, you know, philosophical question we've been, a been asking is like, what is the true role of the marketer, right? And so I think it, it actually makes sense for us to kind of like, don't quote me on this, but like to reorganize like the shopper and e-business team is almost like a performance marketing team, whether or not we have the right people, you know, whatever, we'll put that aside. And then having brand just like still focus on like equity, awareness and that sort of thing. But that seems like an interesting delineation. And what's really hard is that you always cut brand spend when you have, when you have margin goals you're trying to hit because that's the spend that doesn't immediately drive results. But that's a short-term view of the impact of marketing, and, but it's really hard to get out of. Every business does it. Anything to add, David? Something happy. Say something happy. <laughs> it's almost five o'clock and the bar is open. <laughs> uh, in the 10 minutes that we do have at the end, uh, while you guys can ask questions, we'd love some answers as well. Especially, and love to hear your thoughts about what is the role of the marketer? Because I was talking to David when we got here, um, and some of the pre preliminary research that we're doing right now is 
uh, the existential crisis of what a digital marketer is going to be in 2019 because um, increasingly the lines between sales, service, and marketing are completely blurred and it's just one big talking to the customer function. Now, marketing owns the, uh, the, the tools to do that, but it doesn't necessarily own the content to do that or the mandate to talk to the customers beyond a certain point in the funnel. Um, so now we're getting into territorial disputes and we're getting into brand marketing versus performance marketing. Um, so would love to hear some thoughts when we get, so hold on to that one. Um, so speaking of which, um, do you guys see things changing very, you, beyond the, the goals that you have right now, which is data analysis and making the stuff that you actually do better, do you see yourself bleeding into, and especially you at the Digital Center of Excellence, uh, sorry, Digital Innovation Center, right? Nah, so, whatever. whatever you want to call it. Uh, do you see your marketing function bleeding into customer support or, yeah. yeah, how's that working out? Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of conversation about bringing customer support from the basement to the penthouse, right? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of times, again, taking a cue from Silicon Valley of like human-centered design, like we talk about consumer first, and I think we say a lot of that stuff, but we don't actually do it because we still have a habit of talking at the consumer. Where it's like, well, we want them to know our functional benefits, like, you know, GMO free. And I'm like, they don't really care. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think there's an opportunity for my team to reorganize around consumer experience, mm -hmm. right? So um, consumer to enable the best consumer experience, it's like, what is the technology that does that? So it kind of changes our view from chasing VR, the shiny thing, to mm -hmm. does this help the con benefit the consumer? Um, so we might like kind of reorg under that and consumer engagement and then yeah. customer services will be a part of that. But I yeah. think we have to kind of just reframe how we think about how we service and how we talk with our consumers. Right. I, I think I was just going to say a great example of that is social platforms, mm -hmm. right? So social platforms can be, they can drive community. They can also drive commerce. Um, but when a consumer has an issue with the brand, more than picking up the phone, they're gonna go to Twitter, they're gonna go to Facebook, now they'll go to Instagram. So we, during the holiday season, our Facebook page almost becomes a customer support function, even while we're running promotions, even while we're engaging with our consumers, because if there's a site issue, if there's an app issue, they're going to Facebook right. and, and posting there. And if you don't stop that, uh, you know, there's a cumulative effect that so how are you guys set up on the marketing side and then people on the customer support side to deal with that shared piece of real estate? Uh, we used to have our social marketing team would work during our Q4 peak, literally 24 hours a day, and they would be briefing and consulting with our customer support team. In this year, we've now transferred the responsibility of that to customer support because they're the expert. So rather than have marketers put on a customer support hat, there will be, have dual functions running simultaneously right. on social platforms. Can I answer yes, your previous please. question around trends that I think are gonna reshape the digital marketer's yes. job? Mm -hmm. I think, I completely agree, I think social is a big one because it, it brings those customer care conversations into the forefront and make them very public. I think the other one is automation and AI. It's gonna completely change mm -hmm. the way that marketing works. And what it will create actually is that uh, it will create a situation where marketing can be completely in control of the customer funnel mm -hmm. because you don't actually need salespeople to answer questions. So this is very much how Dropbox operated. Yeah. Uh, a, a good portion of the business at Dropbox was driven through chat and uh, and actually through self-serve. Mm -hmm. And so marketing actually owned all the way down to revenue because you didn't actually need any other functions. Right. So I think as we automate more of the, the sales and support conversations, more a bigger role of driving revenue will actually come into marketing. Got it. Um, that, I'd hate to end at this point, and I know we're, we're slightly over time, but is it okay if we take a couple questions? Sure. Sure, okay, <laughs> great. Well, this has been the best panel, so. <laughs> <laughs> you do say so. I, the I agree. It was, totally. <laughs> it was an awesome panel. Thank you. So not specific to personalization, but think about if you had all the resources you need, you have no legacy systems, you can do whatever you want, what would you build? You, you talked about back end, you talked about data lakes, DMP, CDP, what, would, what do you want? Wow, that's such a good question. 
I'm having like choice paralysis right now. <laughs> Sheila. I, I would build a better system to integrate data because I think that's actually the key to the future. Uh, I would have an entire engineering team <laughs> on my team so I could uh, continue to build custom funnels because like we're just gated on end resources always right you never have enough engineers for anything data scientists for anything um, so I would build that infrastructure so we could deliver custom content uh, to people as they identify needs because that's just going to allow us to make the most out of our dollars facilitators play a really important role and uh, one of the comments that you made is, you know, shifting from a madman world to a mathman world, that kind of thing. Um, it's, it's so amazing to hear some of the commonalities and, and that sort of thing. So many agencies, you know, big agencies, global agencies, that kind of thing, start still from broadcast. Yeah. Start, still start from a ton of money TV there. print, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And it's really interesting that um, you know, as you get and there's social agencies and digital agencies, and there's some blend and that kind of thing, but content and in you know, content and personalization still seems to be a challenge. As much as it's been talked about, it's hard to find somebody who's really mastered that. My question is, have you found anybody, or do you have insights as to agencies that have really mastered that content part? Holistically. You have to build it in-house. That, that's my take. And the reason for that is the internal data is so critical to inform the strategy. It's really hard for an agency to know yeah. how to act on it. That said, I mean, maybe there's a model that, that I haven't encountered yet with an agency where they can be really, really steeped in your data. I, my personal take, and I have lots of friends in the agency world and wonderful agencies I've partnered with, but I think that's that model is going to expire soon because the, the future is in data and customization and automation on marketing. And I think to build on your point about building that capability in-house, I mean, you can have a creative um, sit next to a data scientist, right? And, and that just doesn't happen within the agency world, and I can say that coming from the agency side as well. Um, and then I think it all boils down to misaligned incentives. I mean, you can, you know, put that on anything. So, like, you know, a large agency, we have a lot of them that we work with, um, they want that lion. They want to go to Cannes. They want to be on the so yacht true. drinking rosé, which is, like, awesome, but also doesn't drive business results for us. And so when you're looking at two different entities um, that don't share the same goal, like they're gonna go off in different directions and we're gonna be dissatisfied with their performance and they're gonna be annoyed because we wanna sell product and that ad is not gonna win them a lion. So um, there, there have been agencies I think that are sprouting up left and right, but there are more performance marketing agencies mm -hmm. um, where the creative team actually does sit down with like the data people and I think that works out well. We're not there yet, um, but that's what I would go. I think to your- for an agency. <laughs> I think to the point that it has to start internal, I think the opportunity will be how do you take that and then turn it into a big idea that can, you know, and not take six months to produce. So as you start to compress those timelines and then maybe the agencies can still translate that into the TV or Super Bowl campaign, but it does start more internally now than it used to be hand off the brief, wait for the concepts, then production, then rosé. Uh, she was being especially prescient about uh, model changing. So we have research right now that shows that 70% uh, of content being produced by co companies for the purpose of personalization is produced in-house. Um, and get this, agencies, uh, companies are, and this varies a little by industry, but companies are as likely to hire an agency as they are to just use user-generated content. So co content created by your customers is now as valuable as stuff created by agencies for like a fraction of the cost. That's really well, and we've seen that in Snickers, right, or Doritos has done the Super Bowl and made it very um, prominent to have user generated. And those often do better than the agency produced. Yeah. We've got time for maybe one last one. Any takers? Okay, well, guys, this has been a fascinating thank conversation. Thank you so much for joining Thanks. us. And thank you all for sitting so patiently. Um, th and thank you for having us here. <laughs>